As Isaac prayed, we'll be celebrating baptisms here in a few minutes. Baptism is a symbol of a work that God's already done inside of those individuals. There's nothing special about the water. It's not holy. There's, God's not going to love them more after than he does today. In fact, if you're a guest with us, I want you to know that there's good news for you. If you know Jesus, or if you don't know Jesus, I want you to know that God loves you, that he sees you, he cares about you. And he desires and longs to have a personal relationship with you. And I'm so glad you're here today. We've been in a series, a series that's taken us a few weeks, a sermon series that we've been talking about, the book of Acts. The book of Acts tells us all about the start of the church, the birth of the church. And today we're looking at Acts chapter 6. So you can follow along on the screens or you can grab a Bible or pull up it on your device, Acts chapter 6. We're going to run into a problem, the very first problem in the church. And you're like, I didn't know there were problems in the church. In fact, it's the first complaint. You're like, really? There's complaining in the church? I know, right? Shocker. It's encouraging for us to know they... They weren't around very long before there were complainings and problems that they had to address. Before we look at the text, I'll tell you that when I was a child, seven or eight, somewhere around there, my parents thought it'd be a good idea to sign me up for Pee Wee Baseball, Little League. I don't even think it was Little League. It was like before Little League. I didn't know what I was doing. If you've ever coached that age, you're like, I just got to try, got to throw this kid in a position. You just see what happens. So they put me at catcher. I got two black eyes, like, first few weeks, just when one healed, you know, I didn't get my glove up in time. Boom, ball comes, hits me in the face. And they're like, well, what are we going to do? Catcher's not his position. So what you do with every kid on a peewee baseball team, you put them in the outfield. That's where you, if you might have 10 outfielders. But that's where you put the kids that didn't have the ability to field or throw. And I do remember the ball getting through the infield, and it made its way to me, and I picked it up. And I knew there was no way I'm going to be able to throw the ball from where I'm standing to, to the next kid. So I ran it in, right? <laughs> ran it in. And at that point, I realized baseball is not my sport. I'm okay with that. But how about those Diamondbacks? Yeah. It was a long way to get there. But <laughs> the Arizona Diamondbacks, they're in the World Series. World Series means there's in the World Championship. Really just the United States, but that's what people in America do when there's a championship, they just say it's, it's the World Series, right? Even though it's just our nation. But anyway, that's another problem. But the, the Diamondbacks are they're in the World Series. It's a big deal. They weren't expected to be there. But I want to talk to you about baseball. In order to play any position requires that you know everybody else's position. Because anytime the ball is put in play, everybody on the field has to move and maneuver based on where that ball went. You have to plan for worst case scenario. If that ball is overthrown to first base, someone's got to back that up to be prepared to get that error. Everybody's got to move. So it requires strategy, it requires planning, it requires preparation. In fact, today, the Diamondbacks, all the hitters are having a meeting all right, about every possible pitcher who will be in the next game. Their weaknesses and pros and their signs and are they good to throw to first base? Is it easy to steal against, right? Every batter's doing that and every pitcher is doing the same thing about batters. It takes preparation. It takes work. If one person doesn't show up or do their job on the Diamondbacks, any position, they lose. It requires the entire team. It doesn't matter how, how much talent is on the team. They're going to lose if they don't do are in the position that they're required to be in. And you're like, what does this have to do with the book of Acts? The church, we're called, the sermon series we're on right now is called Sense. It's ecclesia is the church. Ek is to be sent. Ecclesia is called. So the called are being sent out. We're being sent out. But the same, we're a body, we're a team. You're a part of, you know Jesus, and you say Boulder Mountain's your home church. You're on the team. 
You're, you're on the team. And this, this is a, we keep score. Like, I don't know about that. Yeah, we keep score. How do we know we keep score? Because the text that we've looked at so far, early book of Acts, they're keeping score. They're counting numbers, right? The first church service, 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. Somebody had to count. The people who had administrative skills, the accountants, they were, they were doing the counting. It was the first database, right, ever recorded. It wasn't digital, it wasn't a computer, but they were, they were counting. It was important. Why? Because every number is a name and every name is a story. There were 3,000 of them. They're keeping score. A few chapters later, 5,000 people gave their life to Jesus. And you got a church of 8,000. And those were the good old days. They look back. Remember the good old days? It was, there was chaos. There was a lot of movement happening. There was this, if you've ever been a part of a new organism or organization that just starts, there's, there isn't really leadership structure yet. It's like, who's in charge of what? I don't know. We're going. Let's do this. That's what they're experiencing. And at Boulder Mountain, we believe we keep score because God keeps score. What do I mean by that? It makes some of us uncomfortable. He said, keeping score. What it means is, Every person matters to God. And he is chasing. As we speak right now, as we gather together, it says God is chasing. He's going after every person. He's going after the one person in the room that may not know Jesus. God is pursuing people. And every person, every person matters to God. So we keep score. How do we keep score? One of the ways is through this tank. It's a baptism tank, today's baptism. In church, one of our values is we celebrate. We're going to celebrate every person who's in the water. Why? Because it's a symbol of what God has done. God has saved. God has redeemed. God has done new life, given new life, given God's at work in this place. And when it talks about being a team, we're going to look at that in a minute. I want you to be a part of what's happening here. And for everyone in the room who has ever served at Boulder Mountain, you're a part of what we're going to celebrate today. If you've ever given a penny to Boulder Mountain, you're a part of what's taking place here. You're part of the team. Thank you for that. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, right? They keep growing. All these people, all these new people. Somebody's sitting in my row today. What's going on? A complaint rose. There we go. There's the, the first complaint in church. It wasn't the last, but it was the first one. A complaint shows up by the Hellenists, Hellenists, right, Greek, Jewish widows, against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The daily distribution. Let me give you some context here. In the temple, the temple, they would care for the widows because the widows were a very marginalized group. The Roman Empire didn't, didn't have anything in place to care for the widows. There wasn't social security. There wasn't unemployment. There wasn't any of that. And so the temple, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they had a system in place to care for the widows. Now, these widows, they're followers of Jesus now. So the temple, it makes sense that they're not going to care for them. In fact, they're their opposition. We're not going to care for these widows. So you had Greek widows and you had Jewish widows. They're both followers of Jesus. Does this make sense? You have one group who's been around for a really long time, and this is the way we do things, and there's some tradition. And then you guess what? You have a new group of people. They're new. We don't know who they are, but they're followers of Jesus too. Can you imagine that those two groups of people wouldn't get along? In church, of all places. But that was what they were experiencing. The widows. And I believe that this is an unintentional wrong. It's a complaint that came to the apostles, to the 12, and they heard the complaint. Now, unintentional wrongs happen every day in our life. I've been unintentionally wrong to somebody else. Somebody else has been wrongly, unintentionally wrong to me. And what do we do with those? We can get mad at them and accuse them and, and angry and start yelling at them, right? Or we can give them some grace. Lean on the side of grace 
as a follower of Jesus, lean on grace every possible time that you can. This is the situation here. Now, the, the 12, they summon the full number of the disciples. So now we also have maybe the first business meeting. I don't know if there were 8,000 people at this business meeting, but there was a, there was a gathering. Hey, we got to solve the problem. Now, anytime somebody comes to you with a complaint, we all have an option, right? Tomorrow morning, Monday morning, when you head to work, there's a long list of problems already waiting for you. So if you're a part of a family, guess what? There's problems. Part of a job, there's problems. You're part of a church, there's problems at church too. And when it comes to someone com making a complaint, you can do a few things. One, you can dismiss it. That's not how you feel. I learned a long time ago, you can't argue with how somebody feels. But you can listen to it. You can listen. You can say, I, I hear you. Thank you for sharing this with me. I, want, I just want you to know, I don't have a solution yet, but I want you to know you've been heard. Man, if, if we can't do that at church, then the rest of the world has no hope. If followers of Jesus are not able to share our concerns and even our complaints at times. And so they, they hear, they hear, they don't dismiss it. I think of all the things that they could have done. I said, well, you know what? Because this is a problem, we're going to stop meeting the needs of all the widows. Right? How do you like it now? Right? I've seen answers to problems being handled that way in church. We're just going to stop. Right? It could have said, well, you know what? I don't think you guys are ever going to get along. So why don't you go start another church down the street? Not a, not a good solution. We'll have the Hellenistic Jewish assembly, and then we'll have the Greek Jews over here and the Jewish Jews from Judea over here, right? But they, they heard the complaint. And followers of Jesus, we should be known as living on the solution side of problems. Solution side of problems. Two ways you can handle a problem. When somebody comes to you and complain, you can agree with them and add fuel to that fire. Make the problem worse. And if you're a leader, you make yourself irrelevant when you do that. Or you can step in and hear the problem and bring water to the fire. You, can, you, have, you always have two, two answers, two possible scenarios every time there's a problem in your life. You can make it worse. You can move toward the solution of it. So followers of Jesus, let's live on the solution side of things, in church, in our families, in our workplace. It takes humility to listen to a problem, especially when it's against you. It takes great humility. Sometimes when somebody's sharing a problem with me, you know what I'm thinking? I'm not listening to them. I'm thinking, how am I going to respond to the person? As they, right? And if we're all honest, we probably all do that. What's my defense? What's my reason? What's my excuse? Rather than, I, I hear you. Thank you. Thanks for pointing out a blind spot I wasn't aware of. And I don't think this was intentional. We talked about unintentional. I think they experienced so much growth so fast that they weren't intentionally deciding. There was just, the, the Jewish widows probably knew more people, had more relationship, and their needs were being met first. And so they recognized the problem. And so the disciples gather, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So the apostles recognized that their, what they were called to do was handle God's word and to pray. Their role wasn't more important or less important than anyone else's role in the church. But that's what God had called them to do. To, to handle the administrative tasks, to oversee the budget. So it wasn't just serving tables to the widows. It was, a, it was getting the list of names. It was understanding how much was in the budget. Who are we going to give? How much are we going to give to the widows? Do they need food? Do they have, have other needs? There's a lot of administrative work. So they, the disciples didn't say, hey, we need to do that and we need to handle preach. But they involved other people to be part of the solution, which is, I, I believe, what God's called our church to do. Hey, here, here are the opportunities, here's the needs, and you're invited to be part of the solution. And so they, they come up with a solution. They invite those in the church to be part of the solution. They said, therefore, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom. Right? So they have good reputation, whom we will appoint to this duty. So we're going to identify some people. You, you give us the names. Who do you think are some people that would represent and handle this problem well? People of good character. They're known. Right? Leadership is most often recognized, not appointed. 
If you're part of an organization, the church is no different, or a business, and you, you need to hire somebody, you have two options. You can hire somebody from within, or you can hire somebody from without. If you hire somebody from without, it's risky, right? The resume looks great, but you, have, you don't know them. You don't know how they show up. You don't know how they work. You don't know the work ethic. You don't know anything about them. They just look good on paper. You hire somebody from within, oh, they're known. We know, we know what they do. We know their character. We know re- reputation. Church, to, to be able to meet needs in the church, we're going to identify leadership in the position, right? So at Boulder Mountain, some of you, your guests with us today, so you can eavesdrop as we talk to those who call Boulder Mountain home. This is how we run our church. There's three, three positions. I'll, just, I'll quickly hit that, and then I want to involve everybody. Number one, we have elders. We have elders. Also, the word is overseer. In scripture, we see the word overseer and elder. And the qualifications to be an elder are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in the book of Titus. And then the next position we have is deacons or deaconesses, you know, men and women who lead ministry. The description we have here in Acts chapter 6 is that of a deacon, although the word doesn't appear here. The word appears later on in the New Testament. So you have those handling God's word, prayer, and then you have those leading ministry. The pastor of the church is also an elder, so I happen to be an elder as well. All right, that's information for you to be aware of. We vote on elders. It's interesting, they did not vote for these seven men. In fact, you don't see voting in the New Testament. You don't see that. It tends to be an American congregational thing within, within the church. And there are things we vote on here at Boulder Mountain. We vote on the budget, we vote on elders, we vote on buying, selling land, and things like that. And we have, we have an opportunity to vote in November. There'll be plenty of food around that vote. We always have food around voting. It's biblical. <laughs> so they picked seven men, seven men who they were known. People tell you who they are. If you, if you oversee people or you've worked with people, right, you work with them for a few weeks and you get to know who they are. And so these seven are, are appointed. Now, interesting, why, why seven? Is it because seven's God's holy number and spiritual, let's pick seven? No, maybe, maybe it's because there were seven days in the week. Stephen, you have Monday. And they each took one day of the week to meet the needs of the widows. They didn't want to give up meeting the needs. And so they invite others into the process. Pick out from you, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, what's interesting, the, 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 the apostles didn't say, we're not going to do that. That's beneath us, that's below us. They didn't say that. In fact, they were probably meeting the needs of the widows to the best of their ability until it outgrew them. Moses has a similar conversation with his father-in-law, Jethro. Where Jethro says, very wise man, His wife's father, I'm sure his wife had some conversations with her dad about, hey, Moses is never home. He's always working. So Jethro pulls Moses aside and says, what you're doing is not sustainable. You can't keep this pace up. You need to invite other people into the process. And so they invite the seven to take over. They were willing to do the administrative tasks, but they recognize what's, what's the wisest use of my time, right? And, and I'd say, what's the wise use of your time in the context of your job and your involvement here in the church? Because you're all in, invited to be part of the team of Boulder Mountain. You're all invited to be part. There's a role, there's a position for you. And it's not that God, I need you or God needs you. It's, truth be told, God doesn't need me and God doesn't need you. But here's the really exciting part. God has invited us to be part of what he's doing. And God has invited us to be part of this today that we're gonna celebrate. And there's nothing greater. There's nothing greater than seeing lives changed and to know that you are a part of that. And if you serve in any capacity at at this church, it's spiritual. This wasn't a, a conversation about spiritual roles, unspiritual roles, because the word is actually the same. To distribute food and to minister is actually the same Greek word. And so if, if you're doing landscape at Boulder Mountain, that's spiritual. That's spiritual. 
as not a position under or above any other position. If you're rocking babies in our children's ministry, thank you. That's a spiritual position. Any role, if you're running the slides, and running sound right now, it's spiritual. If you're on the worship team, any, any position God has called you to within the church is a spiritual position. It's not that they, they said this job is beneath us. It says, what would be the wise use of my time? I had a mentor friend of mine who I'm so grateful for the relationship I had with him when he was teaching me about preaching. He said, how many minutes are you going to be preaching? That's how many hours you should be preparing, studying for that message. So if you're doing a five-minute devotional, it's five hours of prep work. If you're doing a 15, right, 30-minute message, spend 30 hours of prep work for that message. And I so appreciate that because it, it elevated the importance and the value of, of God's word. But we're not to handle this lightly. And I'll say to you, every, every hour I'm, I'm doing something else, we all suffer. Because I didn't spend that time on the message, right? I'm willing to do anything. And I know you are as well. But the most important job God's called me to as your pastor is to make sure I'm handling God's word. There are times I want to show up to hospital rooms and please let me know. I, I want to be aware. I want to know. I want to be able to shepherd. I love walking into, I don't love the situation, but I love the opportunity I have to shepherd in hospital rooms. But I want, you, I want everybody in the room to hear this. This is really important. If you know Jesus, you've given your life to Jesus. You are a saint. You are, the Bible says, you are a priest. And if you gave your life to Jesus one minute ago, now your position is that of a saint. Now, in some traditions, there's a whole lot of jumps you gotta, hoops you got to jump through in order to be a saint. One, you got to die, right? And then, then there's, then eventually it gets to the Pope and the Pope's got to make you a saint, right? Biblically speaking, we believe that if you've given your life to Jesus, you're a saint. You're a priest. It is not about me being any different than you. You and I both represent Jesus in every room we walk into this week. You represent Jesus in your job, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your family room, at the kitchen table. You can minister to people. I love reading scripture and praying and, and coming along somebody's bedside in the hospital room. I love doing all the pastoral duties that God's called me to do. But I also want you to know, you can as well. And you're like, ah, it scares me. Yeah, we're all supposed to take steps of, of faith that scare us a little bit, right? My job, my primary job, handling God's word preaching, but also I'm told in Ephesians 4.12, and for others of you in the church who lead ministry, our job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Because I tell you, the things that I do, there are 10 other people in this room who can do them 10 times better than I can. And so I am inviting you to be part of what God is doing in this place. Different positions, and different roles. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 that he likens the church to the body. Right? We get the opportunity to be the body of Jesus Christ. Also, another analogy is the living stones that make up the church. We are living stones. And you represent Jesus. You do not need a title to represent Jesus. And for those of us, we have a small group of elders right now. We have a small group of deacons. We need to add to both of those groups. And so all of us in the room, we're told in Scripture the qualifications to be an elder, the qualifications to be a deacon. Before it goes into the qualifications, it says, aspire, aspire to be a deacon, right? The, the list of characteristics are great. There's no harm in striving for those characteristics. And you can read those. And again, 1 Timothy 3, 8 through the rest of the chapter talks about the qualifications. Aspire to, to be those. So let's, church, let's live on the solution side of problems. And listen to this, verse four. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then this blew my mind away, verse five. I was like, 
underline, highlight this thing, because has this ever happened in the history of the church? What they said pleased the whole gathering. <laughs> has there ever been a time in a church environment that you've been in where everybody was happy? Everybody? Everybody was pleased? Oh, if Satan, the enemy, did not want to see the church take off. So he did everything he could to disrupt the growth of the church. He used persecution. That didn't work. The church only grew. He used persecution, the church grew. Now he's going to use division. And if he can create a problem, if he can get us to focus on the problems among us and to think about only us, we lose sight. You know what we lose sight of? We lose sight of the scoreboard. We lose sight of the people who aren't here because we're so busy fighting within and arguing and complaining. And I'm so grateful that is not the case at Boulder Mountain. I'm so grateful that the, the myth, or not, not a myth, is actually true in many churches that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I don't know if you've ever heard that stat. 20% of the people do 80% of the giving. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That's not true here. In fact, we have more people involved in live nativity than we have people in our church. I don't even, I don't know, I don't understand that. I don't know how that works out. That's a pretty cool thing, I guess. But I think that, I think the number is close to 60 to 70% of Boulder Mountain is serving on a regular basis. But it's not 100%. What would it look like for 100% to find our role? I got to be honest with you, you may take some time. The first position that you step up to serve in may not be where God keeps you forever. You're like, yeah, I worked in that toddler room and I'll never again, right? <laughs> but you don't know until you try. So use your gifts. And then, okay, now I know. Hey, I, I did that. Now I know. I played catcher one time. Never again. They put me in another position. But would you be willing to step up and find a place to serve? And I also want to give you permission. If you see a need at Boulder Mountain, you do not need to run it by the pastor before you meet that need. My wife and I rented apartments and duplexes for most of our marriage. And we currently own now. But there's a difference in renters versus owners, right? When you rent and there's a problem, guess what you call? It's somebody else's problem. If you're a member of Boulder Mountain Church, you're an attender, this is your home church. I'm going to encourage you to own. You're an owner. That means we own the good, we own this. And we also own the problems. And so communicate, always good to communicate. They did a really good job, Acts chapter 6. They communicated, hey, here's a problem. We want to involve you. Would you part, be part of the solution? And then, they, then they solved the problem. So no surprises. Let's, let's have that agreement, no surprises. But let's, let's meet needs. There's a lot of needs right now. Let me just throw a few out there. Landscaping at Boulder Mountain. There's opportunities. A children's ministry, we doubled a... We added another service, and so there's opportunities to work in our children's ministry. Uh, administration, a lot of different administrative needs. Security, currently do not have a security team. These are opportunities, and if you feel like God's leading you to step up in one of those areas, let, let me know. You're invited to be part of the team. And I'm so grateful for the work and the way that you all are using, using your gifts. Let's give each other the benefit of the doubt when problems arise. In fact, I'd say that's a good thing to do in home, in work, but also in church. And if someone comes to you with a complaint, live on the solution side of that problem. If someone comes to you with a complaint about someone else, right, send them to that person. That's biblical. Fill in the gaps of what you know and what you do not know with trust. Please do that for each other. Go to the person. Say, well, I know you. I know you love Jesus. You know me. You know I love Jesus. Does that sound like something they would do or say? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill in the gaps with trust. Let's not give the enemy a foothold in division in our church. I'm not saying that's happening. But I want to make sure it doesn't happen tomorrow or next day, Right? But stay unified because you are not my enemy. And by, I hope I'm not your enemy. The person who disagrees with me is not the enemy. 
the people who don't know Jesus are my friends. I want them to know Jesus. There is an enemy. We have an enemy. But the people we have arguments with, they're not the enemy. I pray that we as a church would recognize that and understand that and grow to love, grow to love people who don't know Jesus. And so I ask you, as we move toward baptism here in a minute, who's going to be in the tank next baptism because of you? Because of your giving, because of your serving, because of your invitation, whose whose life is going to be changed? God does the life change. God does the saving. We don't. But our job is to create the environment. So we have five individuals here. We're going to pray and we're going to talk about baptism in just a moment. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would stir in our hearts. I pray that those who are serving on a regular basis would be so encouraged by what they're going to witness today. Thank you for the act of baptism, the opportunity we have to publicly proclaim our faith in front of friends and family. God, thank you for loving us beyond what we could ever imagine. I pray you would move in the next few moments here. I pray, Father, if anyone in the room does not have a personal relationship with you, that today would be the day they recognize that they need to repent from their sin, to turn to you, and to surrender their life and to simply say, I cannot do this anymore. And Jesus, I recognize that you paid the price. You paid the price that I could never pay and you lived the perfect life that I could never live. And in faith, I give my life to you. I say yes to Jesus today. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.